sometimes I forget. Uh, and welcome everybody. I'm so thrilled to, to have you join us tonight. Uh, I've known Danny for a few years. We've been selling their products from Patagonia Fish uh, and they're just amazing. My name is Grace Singleton. I'm a partner here at the deli and I've been hosting a few of these tastings. Uh, I'm also the buyer at the deli who buys all the grocery items, olive oils, vinegars, fish, preserves, things like that. So if you have suggestions or requests, you can always send them to me. Uh, and then we have Danny here from Patagonia, who is the sales manager at Patagonia Fish. Uh, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about Patagonia and why they're doing food and about these wonderful products that we have to taste. So I will, let me put this little screen up here, Danny, and then we'll get started. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody joining in and trying our seafood. Like Grace said, we've been working together for a few years and, and beforehand in my times, actually in my previous job, I was trying to sell Zingerman's apple juice uh, to no luck, but when I'd come and visit my younger brother, but um, you know, this, we found a really good match at this, uh, with this new adventure of Patagonia. If you're not familiar, Patagonia is a 46-year-old Patagonia Inc. Patagonia is also a region in South America, but Patagonia Inc. is a 46-year-old outdoor apparel company started by Yvonne Chouinard. Um, originally, he started Chouinard Equipment, which was making pitons for climbing. And he found when he was climbing uh, in, I think, Scotland or Ireland, he found these rugby shirts and the collar of the rugby shirt protected his neck when he was carrying ropes and stuff. And he found a lot of utility in that. And so he started bringing them over and selling them to his friends and more and more people were interested in buying them. And he's like, Oh, there's something here. And so then they started really developing apparel that they wanted to use in their activities outside. And now, you know, Patagonia is a global outdoor apparel manufacturer and uh, a lot of what we do and how we do business is unconventional, similar to how Zingerman's does business. So there's a lot of um, great synergy between our organizations. So 1% of all our sales are being donated to environmental grassroots nonprofits. We're con like My favorite thing about working here is this constant focus on continuous improvement. So how do we do things better? Um, how do we do things better? A lot of it's environmental focus. How do we do things better for the environment? How do we reduce our harm and do more good uh, within the systems that we work in. So with, with apparel, part of our strategy in that is we wanna make something so great and so durable that it lasts you 10 years, that you're not buying something new every year. If it breaks on you, we have the largest repair facility in North America and we will fix your jacket for you instead of selling you a new one. Well, with, you know, that's working and uh, we're having some impact there. But the Chenards were like, what else can we do? And Yvonne had been wanting to do a food company for a while and people eat three times a day. So how do we take this Patagonia business philosophy, mission and ethos and apply it to a food system and, and try and impact and inspire positive change within that? And so here we are. And now we have about 36 items ranging from crackers that use a uh, uh, perennial tree fruit called breadfruit um and canned seafood soups side dishes uh bison jerky all sorts of things we have two beer skews that feature a perennial grain called kernza one's a pale ale and a wit to start a conversation around perennial agriculture in in the grain systems the seafood what we work with zingerman specifically is from our perspective a way to get people to take some attention and pressure off of bigger more consumed species and bring them lower on the food chain in the ocean. So we have uh, mussels, which we'll be trying, which are very passively grown uh, on wooden, they call, they're called bateas in Spain and they're wooden rafts with ropes hanging down, the mussels congregate and they just grow, they're feeding themselves, they're very low impact on the ecosystem and they're very delicious and provide a great source of protein. We work with an amazing uh, manufacturer over there that's about a hundred years old, they're fourth generation, um, and they grow these mussels and then have a very high quality production facility and can them. And we've, we've built kind of our own North American recipes that they've worked with us on and then bring them over and, and offer them to customers here. Um, a big thing, our, our co-manufacturer is called Perez La Fuente. And they saw, so in the 1950s, 
they saw an opportunity to pioneer this muscle cultivation in their in their clean waters uh, off the coast of Galicia. And they also saw this massive consolidation happening in the canned seafood industry in Spain. And then a lot of um, it being outsourced to these like big production facilities. And so for them to differentiate themselves, they really focused on why they get, got it started. So locally sourced ingredients, high quality and sustainability were all like big things for them. And now, you know, they're, they're the, the muscles are certified organic to the EU organic standards. We don't have an equivalent here in the United States, but what that means is clean waters, well monitored, always tested, uh, specific materials that the muscles can be grown on. And it's just uh, an adherence to quality in their perspective there. And then every supporting ingredient in the can is certified organic as well. So the olive oil and the spices and the herbs. In that same vein, we've got our mackerel, which are all hook and line caught in the Bay of Biscay. And those, again, a smaller, lower on the food, food chain forage fish that are really delicious. And the, the Spanish people we work with do a very, very good job of delivering a very delicious product. And it's not as widely consumed here in North America, and we're trying to help with that. So we've got our, our mackerel as well. And as Grace um, just brought up, this is how they're caught. So there's no bait. It's a string of hooks with a red wool twine tied around it. The mackerel identify that as a crustacean that they like to eat, and they key into it. And really, in, with all our fisheries, a really important thing is trying to minimize bycatch to the best of our ability. And this does that. It allows, like, really the mackerel is the only thing keying into this, coming in and biting the hooks. They're bringing it in and, and just catching mackerel as they're intended. And then the other, I might be, I'm a little off script here, Grace, probably. It's quite <laughs> little, right. little, It's good. Little, right? Moving it's a little fast. <laughs> but we also uh, source salmon, which is in the dip that Zingerman so deliciously put together. And the story there is really trying to maintain an economic benefit on salmon ecosystems. And so that these animals are protected and things that are hard on those ecosystems, dams, uh, mines, uh, pollution and runoff. They found in the Northwest that actually there's a material in t car tires that are affected, that's running off into the waterways and affecting salmon. So, so adhering and showing that these things are not only just amazing creatures and important to their ecosystems. I mean, I'm, I'm an Alaskan kid. I was a fly fishing guide before this in Western Alaska and literally everything out there exists because of salmon. The bears are eating the salmon, the, the birds are eating the salmon. I mean, I've seen ducks eating dead salmon the the around the rivers all that riparian habitat is is um, nourished by salmon delivered nutrients that they're collecting out in the ocean and bringing back as they return to their natal natal streams and spawning i mean it's it's an absolutely incredible thing and um it's for human consumption and as a food source for us it's a, in alaska where there's very little adulteration to their ecosystems the commercial fleet in Bristol Bay, where we don't source salmon, but I am very familiar with, they'll catch 30 million sockeye salmon, which is one of five species, five specific Pacific species. And the states determined that like two and a half million, if two and a half million sockeye return to the rivers and spawn, that that is uh, a sufficient broodstock to maintain healthy population. Well, sure enough, four years later, the commercial fleet will catch another 30 million. And that's, there's zero human inputs there. there I mean, we're taking, but we're also maintaining and these these are resilient animals keep coming back and uh it's pretty incredible so it just shows that if you maintain and are a good steward to the ecosystems that you function in and live in and are part of that things can function together yeah. um and so that's kind of the story we're trying to highlight there really and also really responsible harvesting methods so not indiscriminately taking from a population, like really well monitored stocks, the rivers are healthy, the populations are healthy, and taking a, um, an appropriate amount to uh, for humans to eat and be nourished from. Yeah. And so that's kind of that, that's everything you're you're trying. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about the food, and then we'll go back and talk a little bit more. And I have some questions for you because I spent the day kind of trolling your website and reading that great journal you sent me, and uh, there's so much good information in there. So. Uh, so this dinner is super fun. Uh, I don't know if any of you have gone, come to any of our previous dinners before, 
but Chef Bill Wallow is the one who helps come up with the menu for all of this. Uh, and so I went to him, I don't know, a month and a half ago and said, hey, I'd love to do this tasting. Danny agreed. We're going to bring Patagonia fish in. Uh, and so Bill and I just talked through the items and then he goes away, scribbles on his pad, thinks a little bit, and then he came up with all the foods that you're eating tonight. Uh, so we wanted to start you out with something that's pretty easy to make at home, uh, the lemon pepper salmon salad. So essentially you could make this at home with super simple ingredients. Uh, we use Calder Dairy sour cream. Uh, we had a package of the Patagonia lemon pepper salmon. Uh, we did a little bit of lemon zest, a little bit of parsley, a little bit of dill, and then we sent you home with some of the bagel chips. Um, we wanted to leave the salmon a little chunky. You could break it up smaller so that it was a, a little bit finer, um, but we kind of like the dressing with that big chunks of salmon in there, uh, which is how we came up with that one. And I'm going to go back to my presentation here. Um, so I pulled this off the website, Danny. Uh, and it talked about all the provisioned salmon that have to be harvested. And this, uh, I'm pretty sure the Pacific Northwest sockeye salmon is what we're doing with the lemon pepper. Is that, did I grab that right? We actually sort the lemon pepper sockeye that people are enjoying are from Alaska. They're oh, okay. from the, as you come down to the Southeast part of Alaska, we source them from Yakutat. Okay. Uh, and one of the things it talks about was place-based fisheries, which I wasn't familiar with. Uh, and that was a really interesting concept to learn about. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's that's what helps us monitor how many fish are going up the river. So you identify a river and and in salmon life cycles, they they are born in freshwater. They then migrate to salt water. Depending on the species, the sockeye that you're eating live four years. And so they go out in the ocean and they're eating sockeye or filter feeders. So they're eating cr krill and plankton and spending that time out there growing bigger. And then they return to their natal river that they were born in. And some say that they're spawning within three feet of where they were born, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so by doing this and, and harvesting in a place and not harvesting indiscriminately out in open water, you're able to really monitor those stocks of salmon to know that you're taking a, um, a healthy amount for consumption. And so that's kind of the concept around place-based fisheries. Yeah. Uh, and also there was quite a bit of information on the, on the website and on some of the blogs about uh, the net pens uh, and how much they're causing pollution and issues uh, with some of the wild salmon. So it sounds like, are they still, it's, there was something on there about trying to get them out of Puget Sound, but I don't know if you've been successful yet in getting there. Yeah, I've, there have been some removals of net pens. There was uh, the, the big story that came out a year or two years ago was the net pen collapse in the Puget Sound and a bunch of Atlantic salmon escape, um, which is not ideal. And the, that project that we're working on is the, the lease of the aquaculture company is up. And, and a group, a con conservation group in Washington that we're supporting has put a bid in to take the lease, mm -hmm. remove the net pens and create a public waterway, like a, essentially a public park space for, for all citizens to enjoy. Yes. And then hopefully that alleviates some pressure off of uh, the wild populations. Yeah, it sounds like it's quite a, quite a problem with the different things that they're feeding in the antibiotics and uh, the waste that's going into the water that's affecting the wild salmon. Plus it sounds like also it's, it's a problem for some of the whales and not being able to have enough food Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, that whale issue is another one in, in the Northwest with that resident orca population that lives there. Here's a picture of uh, one of the salmon. Yeah, it's a fisherman in, in Yakutat holding a freshly caught male sockeye um, that will then get put on slush ice and, and move to the production like fillet facility. That's awesome. And then we, then we get the fillets down to our uh, manufacturing in Washington and everything's then turned into finished goods in Washington state. Yeah, it's a great process you use. I was pretty um, skeptical of a shelf stable salmon when you when you first brought it <laughs> because there's a lot of products out there that we've seen that way, whether it's smoked salmon or other salmons and the flavor usually isn't there. Uh, and you've done just an amazing job with get the texture and the flavor being sustaining. And it's wonderful. And we get so many people stopping in who are going camping and things and take it, uh, not to mention just using it in regular use. Yeah, I, uh, as an Alaskan salmon stops, like absolute snob about salmon, I was, when I was preparing to interview for the job, I was quite nervous 
about i was like oh i got i hope i love the salmon yeah and i tried it. i was like oh I, this is very good i'm very this is that's a great weight off my chest <laughs> yeah it's it's delicious all the different ones there's also the the classic smoked and then the uh pink salmon yep we have the the pink salmon that we source from Lummy Island. And the unique story there is that there's a group of fishermen that are fishing in a very uh, stationary passive way called reef netting. And so there, and it's, it's a modern take on an indigenous method. And the, the Lummy people would have two canoes with a net suspended between them and as, as the salmon migrated and they saw fish swim over the nets, they'd raise the nets and roll them in. Well, the fishermen we work with have these anchored out platforms that are run on solar power and there's a bigger net suspended in between them. And as the salmon are migrating to their river, there's two spotters on platforms and they'll see a massive fish over the net and roll the like, you know, let it roll in the gears and they'll they'll pull the nets up, collect the fish. They roll all the fish into a live well. And so in that case, if there's any non-targeted species, they can put them right back into the ocean. And then everything they're looking for, they handle, bleed for quality, and then put on slush ice immediately. So it's a pretty interesting, in, like very intricate, uh, intimate little fishery. Yeah, really different process than like the dredging of the nets across the bottom where you're just bringing everything up. It's really targeted. Very targeted, Where is yeah. that Lupini place? Lummy? It's, yeah. it's, it's off the northwestern coast of Washington State in the Salish Sea. All right, that's our salmon dish. And then we have mackerel is the next thing I thought that would be the best to taste in order. Uh, so we took the smoked mackerel and made a caponata with it. Uh, and let me, let me go here first. So we saw the photos of that. Um, and this is, you guys just brought this on pretty recently. You've had the other mackerel for a while, but the smoked is pretty new. Yeah, Brent, we launched it maybe a, two months ago. Uh, so we took some Castle Voltrano green olives, which are those big, fat green olives that are crisp uh, and have a lot of oil content in them. Uh, and then we added some capers, some tomato, some oregano, some celery, some onion, uh, and we used some of the San Giacomo red wine vinegar. Uh, kind of put that all together. Uh, there's also some, I believe there's eggplant in here that Bill didn't put on my list, but I believe there's roasted eggplant in here as well, which really kind of rounds it out nicely. Uh, and then, I mean, super simple. So the amount of mackerel that's in these tins also was pretty amazing. Everyone got about a quarter of a tin. Uh, so if you think about how much you're getting in a full serving of that tin, there's a really nice portion in there. And I love the smoke on this. Uh, it's not overpowering, but in the olive oil that you're using is also really good. <laughs> yeah, it's it was an office favorite of our office that eats seafood. It was it became an office favorite immediately and a, a favorite of mine immediately as well. Um, I fully agree on the, the smoke level and I've never had caponata and this is incredible, like a very flattering use of the product. So thank you. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, so mackerel kind of interesting because they're lower on the food chain. Uh, and so yeah. Small schooling fish, uh, Atlantic mackerel, specifically there are different mackerel in the mackerel family, but we're, what we're using are these small Atlantic mackerel, um, eating krill and other small little creatures and uh, very delicious. I think the, the, my interpretation of mackerel and maybe a common one in North America is an oily fish Yeah, and it does have a fat content, but it's not fishy like you might expect from a very oily fish and it's it's very pleasant um and nice you get that nice meaty texture that you might get from a bigger predatory fish like tuna that's very satisfying in my opinion yeah and the oils are all good for you it's all that omega-3 oils which are also good for you and then how are they so they're catching the mackerel are they holding it and then is there a separate smoker that's working with them or so they have a smoker at their facility, yeah. So they'll transport everything from the fisher, fishery to their facility and the ones that get smoked go through their smoking process uh, and then they're hand packed afterwards into the cans with the olive oil sealed and then sterilized and on the boat yeah. to Seattle, Washington. And then the other one, the lemon caper uh, macro that you have. So that is that cooked in the tin? 
Yeah, in the process of the to finish it, they cook everything at the end uh, to ensure safety okay. um, and kind of marry everything. Yeah, I had never realized that tinned fish were cooked in the tin before until I got to visit a place doing tuna, and I was like, "Oh, I see." <laughs> Pack it raw and then cook it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, and then we go into mussels, and you sent some great photos of the mussels. I thought. Let's see here. Um, let me go over here first. So these are these columns where they're growing that you were talking about. Yeah, those are the what the Spanish call bateas. So there's a wooden raft uh, that those ropes, natural fiber ropes, are hanging off of, and the mussels congregate. They just their their spat is floating around in the water, and they're like, "Oh, this is a great place to latch onto and set up a home," and and then they start growing. And they just naturally and they, appear. Yep. Yeah. And then they're just eating plankton as it floats by, very passive filter feeders, and. Uh, and turn into a very delicious morsel. Yes. And I wasn't sure if this photo was mussels as well. It looked like it was. It, it is. So that's the batea. And that's, uh, I don't know exactly what he's doing. If he's just inspecting a line or I uh, can make some assumptions that are probably wrong, but maybe prepping for harvest. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's where the mussels grow. And how long does it take them to get to maturity? Do you know? I don't know an exact timeline off the top of my head but they're pretty quick growing i think from what i've heard yeah it's a seasonal it is a season so they'll grow in a like in a seasonal window i just don't know if it's six eight twelve months yep and these look like some of the folks harvesting mm -hmm. so i like the description tiny eco heroes of the sea that you had on the website <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's also a great um, Paul Greenberg, who's a, a author in the seafood space that wrote books like the F uh, four fish and the Omega principle has a great article on our website also um, that I highly recommend reading. It's pretty entertaining. Yeah. There's a ton of good stuff on your website. There's some movies and blogs and a bunch of different videos that are showing all the different processes that are really great to look at. So with the mussels, we did two different things. So we used the um, sofrito mussels uh, with the saffron rice. So we just did the bomba rice with a little bit of saffron, uh, added some onion, garlic, there's some piquillo peppers, parsley, and thyme in there. Uh, and then just kind of top that with the sofrito mussels at the end. Uh, and then you want to talk a little bit about the differences in the mussels, Danny? Yeah, so we did three different preparations for ours. Uh, we have a smoked, so that it, it's lightly smoked and then just packed in its broth and, and organic olive oil. Even, so the start of the tin fish line for us was Yvonne said, I want to do tin mussels. And so we, when the, when the big boss says they want to do tin mussels, we do tin mussels. And like I grew up eating canned seafood, so I was pretty excited. But um, smoked is kind of that it's everyone's favorite. It's super robust and rich and smooth and works well in tons of different preparations. We also do a sofrito, which is kind of, uh, it's, it's bell pepper, onion, and tomato. And it's this stewy kind of, I just say it's stewy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's my personal favorite of the three. It's, it's versatile. I love putting it on pasta. Um, and it adds a really nice rich flavor to the mussels. And then we have a lemon herb, which is your kind of standard thyme, uh, olive oil, garlic application. Yeah. Also sure. versatile. But just trying to show people, like when I do, when I when I meet people and tell them what I do or talk about some of our products or give people samples of our mussels, the reaction I get a lot, if you're not like a canned fish aficionado, is I didn't know I was gonna like this. Yeah. Like if you had asked me if I wanted to eat, I didn't even know they put mussels in cans. And if you had asked me if I was going to like that, I would probably say no. And, and most people are very, very pleasantly surprised. So it's, that's, those are my favorite people. Yeah. Yeah. The smoked mussels are just incredible. When that was the first thing that uh, you, you sent us a taste and I was like, Oh my goodness, these are so delicious. Um, uh, Gail was asking what does bombs mean? I think bomba. 
Uh, so bomba is a type of rice. There's multiple different styles of rice. Uh, and bomba is a very short grain little rice that we often use for making paella. Uh, it absorbs really well and kind of holds its shape and keeps a little nice al dente uh, to it when we, when we do it. So I think that's what you're referring to, Gail. Um, and sounds like Allison, you didn't get any risotto. I'm so sorry. We must have totally mispacked your bag. I can get you some, but probably not right at the moment. Uh, no. I apologize for that. Fine. There's plenty of food. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, but I can get you a side if you want to stop by and grab one. I, I still have some left. Um, so with the saffron rice I talked about, the uh, smoked mussels are with the gentile pasta. So we use the Vesuvio shape, which I love because it holds on to the sauce really well. Uh, and the gentile pasta is from Italy. It's uh, Senatore Capelle wheat. Uh, it's all organic uh, and it's all pasta that is done with bronze dyes. And the bronze dyes, you can tell the pasta, it has this nice little roughness on it. Uh, versus a lot of the pastas you'll see uh, in the grocery stores will be super smooth and shiny on the outside and they don't hold the sauce as well. So you need those old bronze dyes to put the pasta through for that. Uh, and then we use some of the Marina Colonna lemon oil with that. So Marina Colonna is in Molise, Italy. Uh, we've been working with her for years. She makes her Paranzana oil, but she makes her olive oils, the citrus ones where she actually presses the fruit with the olives. Uh, it's a much harder process. The people who are running the mills hate it because you have to clean all that citrus out of the mill before you go do anything else. But the flavor is so much superior when you're actually putting whole lemon or whole mandarins or oranges in there. So we used her lemon oil uh, and then just a little bit of parsley and a little bit of our tele cherry black pepper to kind of finish it off. Uh, there was a, I was looking at that journal that you sent me, which I don't know if, um, is this something that you sell? or is it just yeah. mailed out? Yeah, just mailed out. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like this is the first year that it was it was put out this last yeah, year? Yeah, first, first brand journal that we've published. If somebody wanted to get a copy, could they stop in at a Patagonia store and get one or how would they go about that? You know, I'm not, I don't know if the Patagonia store is the best route right now, but that's possible. Um, I think on our website, you can request one or we have a customer service. Okay. Um, line at our website also at patagoniaprovisions.com where you can request a copy of the journal. So it's a it's a really nice kind of magazine format that uh, is put together and has information in here on Patagonia, but it also has articles in here with Dan Barber. Uh, and there's information in here on the kerns of wheat that's being done in Kansas. Um, there was a quote that uh, Yvonne had in here that says, uh, we now know that foods grown in ways that regenerate the environment, that promote biodiversity, that deliver the most nutrition are one and the same. And the best part of it all, at least for me, is that these are also the foods with the most spectacular flavors. Uh, and you know, that's one of the things that's fascinating as you start really looking into food production. And it's something Ari has always talked about is, you know, we really try to pick foods that have the best flavor. And what we generally find is the foods that have the best flavor are also the best for you. And now there's a lot of science out there where people are testing it and they're finding that, you know, uh, he even talks in here about the carrots being grown and they went through two frosts and they're in the right soil and there's still a nice microbiome in the soil uh, and they're much more nutritious where they're testing foods from 50 years ago to now and they're finding the nutrition levels much less and i think it's for everything whether you compare pen salmon to wild salmon you're seeing the difference in the flavor and in the nutrition content of them and uh, it makes a huge difference in how you actually process the foods and i love how much uh, Patagonia has just stepped forward and really kind of embraced all that and is, is helping help spread the word. Yeah, deeply. That's kind of the whole reason for being is, is helping spread that word and showing, um, showing a path. And there's a lot of people working in this space and it's becoming more and more, like you're learning now as it, as more attention gets to it, the people that don't necessarily get a platform or get to you know, have as, as much attention on them as a brand like Patagonia does are doing this work also. Um, and so it's just really exciting kind of that getting that whole network of people together and working towards the same thing, like as Yvonne would say also, you can accomplish a lot through that. Um, and so it's not just us, but yeah, if you think about an extractive system, there's nothing left for those some of those plants to bring into themselves. Like if their soil has been grown in extractive ways for years and years and years, it's just not the same as like a, a wild ecosystem replenishing itself and everything's interacting and supplying what the other thing needs in this kind of grand symbiosis of an ecosystem. So if we can mimic that, 
it'll be better for lots of reasons. Yeah, the regenerative agriculture is really the way to go, right? It's beyond organic. It's it's bringing back and giving life back to the soil and back to the environment, uh, and all the different work with the diverse forests that are nearby, and it also helps all of the pollinators and everything else. So there's there there is seeming to be a groundswell. Um, it kind of reminds me of like the the beer trade in Michigan. For a while there, we had no breweries, and then a law got passed, and we started having all these breweries, and now we are like the second most populous breweries in the in the U.S. because everybody started making beer, right? And uh, good and ones, really good, good ones. ones, yeah. And craft beer across the U.S. started bubbling up, right? And then uh, American cheese makers started bubbling up, and now there's all these great American cheeses that didn't exist, you know, 40, 50 years ago that are just exceptional. And I see the same thing happening in agriculture where there's just a groundswell of different things happening, whether it's planting hedgerows in the fields, which actually helps bring the pollinators in and helps support actually better uh, pollination of all the plants. And there's just a ton of different things going on that are that are great. Uh, hopefully we can all make a big difference and, and help make the food yeah, no, better. Totally. And you mentioned one earlier, the microbiome in the soil is a wildly important thing that is easy to overlook because you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And the stat that we throw around is there's more life in one teaspoon of soil than all like walking creatures on the face of the earth. So it's, there's a lot going on then. Yeah. Yeah. This is interesting. One of the things uh, was he talked about in the journal was uh, he started putting a filter on his water when he watered his garden to keep the chlorinated water out because he hadn't seen any worms. And when he stopped using the chlorinated water, he saw the worms. And it made me think of my own garden because I have a couple of different sections. In one section, I totally water only with a rain barrel. And I had like these worms that were just massive. And then I had another section and I didn't have any. And I thought, hmm, I might need to start filtering that water or get another rain barrel. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, I think we made it through all of the different foods. Does anybody have any other questions for Danny about any of the... Uh, Oh, Gail says mussels are usually so unpleasantly chewy and sandy. Yeah, I hate sandy mussels. Uh, and these are velvety and wonderful. Uh, is it the uniqueness of the mussels or the cooking technique or the growing process? I think it's the way they're prepared is how, how that comes out. You will get a little bit more bounce on like a steamed mussel. I think, I mean, they don't want any sand going into the can. So I think there's an adherence to quality in that process. Yeah. Um, but it's the way that they're processed. And then ours, like Yvonne really wanted, he's a big fan of that broth that you get when you steam clams or steam mussels or uh, shellfish. It's very, I, I love it too. It's the salty, great broth to dip bread in or I drink it out of the cup. But uh, we wanted to include a little bit of that. So that might be part of that. Uh, the oil mixed with the broth and the process probably creates that less of a bounce and, and the grit is... Uh, a testament to the quality of our, our group that we work with. Yeah, and I think sometimes the grit, um, I don't know about mussels so much, but I know with oysters and clams, they often put them in a, um, in a water filtration so they get to get some water going through them that isn't in the ocean uh, so that they can kind of purify themselves and get all of that out. Or I've also heard uh, if you buy mussels or oysters and mussels and like you're having them at home and you think they might be sandy, you can put oatmeal in the water. I don't no. know. So that's an old cook's trick. Uh, they put oatmeal in the water and then they eat the oatmeal and then they kind of poop out any sand and then you can eat them and they're not sandy. So I heard that one, but that's an interesting trick. Yeah, we used to do that all the time in the seafood restaurants I worked at. <laughs> um, Amy asked about the recipes. We didn't really put together recipes. We tried to give you just all the ingredients um, so that you could know exactly what was in there. Um, the particular brand of olive oil is listed in that sheet that we gave you. So it is the Kelowna lemon oil. And I can put a link in the chat here. Um, all of these items are sold on our website and you can pick them up at the deli. Uh, so that's uh, one place that you can just search for Kelowna oil uh, and you, that will come right up for you. Here's the link for that. I didn't like it. Give me a second. I have a hard time talking and copying links at the same time. <laughs> If anybody has any other questions for Danny or myself, we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I was wondering how, first of all, everything was delicious and this was really interesting. So thank you, everybody. Well, thank um, you. We were wondering how, um, how you decided to, whether the decision to focus on the tin fish was uh, an environmental 
or sustainable decision as opposed to say getting involved in uh, like shipping frozen fish uh, across the country or if that was like a logistics decision or a flavor decision or an environmental decision or whether you might be getting into something like that in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. I think to start out with, we had really focused on the pantry and like a shelf stable variation. And so how we look at, at tin fish is you're preserving the catch. Um, and we're all big fans of frozen fish also. I, I am particularly because you get very high quality fish, especially with the freezing technologies that are happening now. I mean, there's cod fisheries in Alaska that are freezing, filleting and freezing the fish on the boat. Um, and, uh, but for us with like our whole theme had been shelf stable and really we just wanted to show people that you can preserve the catch. It's super delicious. It's really versatile. Um, and, uh, a, 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 an efficient way to move nutrients around. So um, yes, we're shipping from Spain in these massive containers and receiving over here to make available to the US customer, but it's uh, a lot of great nutrients that we're bringing that don't go bad um, and, and gives people some time. And then also just to show that like these shelf stable options are there's a lot of quality options out there uh, that are very versatile and that you can eat regularly and, and maybe, you know, there's a, if you look at not so much Zingerman's as they have a very unique uh, selection and offering, but if you looked at your standard supermarket store, it's like 80% of it's tuna. So how do you take some pressure off those big predatory fish that are very widely consumed and alleviate um, some of that pressure by just, you know, you ate, say someone eats tuna three days a week, we'll eat tuna one day a week, mussels one day and mackerel one day. And now you, your personal consumption has kind of reduced uh, the, the uh, pressure on tuna um, in a perfect world kind of theory way. Um, and uh, the frozen piece for us in the future is definitely something we've, we've thrown around for a while. Uh, it's just how do we adhere to kind of our standards and mission and ship efficiently um, frozen products to customers uh, throughout the country. Uh, a couple of Thanks. questions about tin fish. <clears throat> uh, Howard is asking, how does the freshness of tin fish compare with other kinds? And I don't know, Howard, if you mean, um, I don't know what the other kinds you're referring to. And then he also asked, does tin fish get better or worse with time? So, so as far as freshness, our fish is prepared very fresh. And if it's not very fresh, it's frozen very fresh and then prepared once thawed and, and ideally frozen once, thawed out once and then put in the can. So the mussels are all, the way the mussels work is that is all fresh preparation. They're harvested, they're steamed and they're packed in a very tight time window throughout the open season that's happening for mussels. The mackerel is a mix. There are fish on ice that weren't frozen that get shipped to our producer and they're filleted and then packed. But there's also based on production capabilities, some are frozen also and then thawed out and prepared. But frozen very, I mean, like I was saying before, freezing fish is, if you, it's, it's where like, as an Alaskan, I just feel bad because like my cousins in the Midwest would be like, salmon's not that good. And I'm like, Yes, it is really good, but they've probably had salmon that's been frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed three or four times as it gets to them. But if you're freezing, handling well, thawing, and then preparing, you get a really high quality product. And then I'll let Grace talk to the aging thing. That's more of a, yeah. a Zingerman's uh, process because I would say they, in my interpretation of it, that aging canned fish is, yields a very delicious product. It does. We definitely have uh, many different types of sardines that have been aged. Uh, and so you can taste the different vintages of them. Um, but I've never, I don't know about aging mussels. I don't, I mean, I don't think they're going to go bad, right? That's one of the things about the food supply is that there's probably some best buy data in there that's pretty far out in the future. But I think past that, you don't have anything to worry about, right? They're not going to go bad unless for some reason the seal is broken and something has happened to it. Um, but I don't, I haven't tested. Maybe we need to work on this, Danny. Maybe we need to take a batch of the mussels and we need to stick a date on them and I'll stick them downstairs and I'll keep them in my nice little cave down there for a couple of years and we'll bring them back out and taste them next to the fresh ones and see if they get a little more silky and delicious. Yeah, that's a, I love that experiment. Start yeah, I don't know about mussels either. I've had aged sardines and they're very good. 
Um, but yeah, I don't, I haven't done the muscles either. They've been out three years now, but we go through them so fast that we don't really, I'd really have to dig around the office to see if there's any cans that anyone's forgot about. Yeah. Yeah. The sardines are delicious as they get aged. They are oh, just wonderful. We have a nice little selection. Uh, mail order has even a larger selection. They go back about 15 years, I think, which is good. Wow. All right. I'm kind of curious about Danny. Thanks so much for for uh, joining us and telling us all about this. I'm kind of curious about what what your longer term vision for Patagonia Provisions is in terms of either sort of the breadth of your dis distribution or um, the the product lines. And apologies if you covered this earlier. I joined a few minutes late. No, good. Also, good question. I think long term plans are to be a food company that um, people can't ignore that we can help guide uh, more regenerative practices and inspire some solutions to, to the problems that we see in food and agriculture um, and show like show and prove that there are these alternative ways to doing things um, that will benefit lots of people. And that could, you know, we as a small, so, so Patagonia provision started in 2012 and Maybe a year later, we launched our first product, which was in 2013. I joined the company in 2016. And when I joined, I think we had five or seven products, and now we have 36. And all of our products have these, these problems that we're trying to solve with the product. And, and then we can grow that and show. And part of it's competing with, with groups that might not be looking to make those solutions-oriented approaches or in, you know, incentivizing them, <clears throat> excuse me, to want to make those in competition, but also educating customers on, on all of these things uh, as well. So it changes, what I'm trying to say is as a small company, it's, it, it changes all the time. Um, and we're learning a lot as we go, but big picture, looking forward, we wanna be a positive force um, for good in this space. And that will manifest, I think, in a, in a variety of ways as we move down uh, and figure those things out. I hope that answers your question, kind of. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Thanks. I, I mean, it's a very inspiring view. Um, I guess I, I, I haven't seen any of the, uh, in, in grocery stores, I'm assuming, do you only sell the Patagonia provisions through Patagonia stores and like maybe REI or I don't know? So we, so Zingerman's has been a partner of ours for a few years. They carry our canned fish. We do work with some natural, mostly in the natural food channel. So the co-ops of the U.S. are partners of ours, uh, independent natural food retailers. We have a lot of specialty food retailers that we're partnered with um, that sell. And it just depends on the item. I mean, we have 36 items uh, that are uh, available through different channels, right? Not everything is carried by everybody. Um, and then we're, it's like a hybrid of, we also sell on our website and we, we work with like-minded partners, um, that appreciate our products and we appreciate their business like Zingerman's. Oh, that's great. We'll have to check it out at Zingerman's next time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Gail's asking, is there other fish varieties, maybe less popular that you would encourage us to consume? Yeah. Um, so there you won't there, you'll have to go to like a zingerman's to find them but like i'm a big fan of anchovies we're actually launching a uh, and, and anchovies are fairly consumed but mostly in the cured and oil form um which i also like on a piece of I, I make sourdough bread at home and i'll butter it up and put i mean grace actually pointed me in the direction of this I forget what brand is this beautiful gold tin that is in the refrigerated section oh, the at, uh, yeah, yeah. Those are amazing. Um, but I don't know how, what, like our, the anchovies we're launching will be more sardine style. And those I think are a lesser consumed uh, species. The other thing is I've had some, some jarred cod that yeah. you don't see that very, that you don't see very often. Zingerman's carries the brand that I like and I can. I love it. It's in your pantry. It's, I actually bought this from Zingerman's. It's uh, very delicious, and I don't think it's a widely consumed um, 
option. You'll, I, I see it here or there. I just do not see it regularly. Yeah. Uh, and then we're working on some pieces that are, you will not see as widely either, but there's, you know, good uh, shelf, other shellfish that's canned. Octopus mm -hmm. is a really good canned product. Um, but you just got to look for the European producers. And are the smaller varieties of fish, like even if they were going over like to Monaghan's fish here in town, gets lots of great fresh fish. If they are heading towards smaller fish versus like tuna and salmon, is that better for the world and for our bodies or? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's a, it's a similar, it's a similar mindset. Um, just in the fresh zone. And I love fresh anchovies, like I'll cure my own fresh anchovies here. Cause there's an anchovy fishery in San Francisco Bay. I live in Sausalito, California. And there's an anchovy fishery. And so I'll go to my little local fish monger, monger and buy a bunch of fresh anchovies and some I'll grill up or fry in a pan or bread and fry in a pan. And some I'll, I'll clean and turn into bocarones and just cure them in vinegar. And it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's kind of fun to, to use these different things. Grilled sardines are very great. Um, herring back home in Alaska, herring and uh, hooligan will eat that are that are smaller forage fish. Oh, I don't know. Hooligan. So huh. it's in the herring family also. Okay. Um, so there's some some great alternative options out there. I'm trying to think, true cod from Alaska, I love frozen um, cod. A little more widely consumed, but yeah, I'm very I'm very I'll always be partial to salmon. Always, always, always. Uh, Ab's asking about canned halibut. That, so my brother and my older brother and I talk about uh, what other Alaskan species we can do. You don't see canned halibut. I think actually wild fish cannery out of Clawwalk oh, might sure. do it. I, th I thought I saw a canned halibut from a group in Alaska, but it, it, it's like a, one of those, did I actually see that? Is that a real product? Yeah, but, I think I did see it because I just picked up their smoked octopus and their smoked herring, which is delicious. Um, and I think they had halibut, but they were out. So I haven't seen mm. it yet. Yeah, it'd be, um, how about if there was one fish that I, if someone was like, Danny, you're only allowed to eat one fish for the rest of your life, it would be a 10 pound or less halibut. Oh, the small ones, okay. Mm, the small ones are, are inside Alaskan tip. The small ones are, we call them chickens and they're a little tastier. Love it, that's great. Chicken, chicken halibut, please. <laughs> uh, Howard's asking about, uh, rec do you recommend cooking or heating tinned fish? You know, I've done, I've done it. Yeah. Like, especially if I'm incorporating it into a dish, it'll be heated up. I love our smoked mackerel with like a really simple garlic cream sauce over pasta. And that's heated up. Ari's uh, email this week featured our smoked mackerel. And he talked about sizzling it just as is in a filet in the pan, which I hadn't done. Um, so yeah, I mean, like the thing about canned fish is there's, it, they're super versatile. You can kind of do whatever you want. And it takes some of the, am I going to overcook it, undercook it? Um, worry. I don't, I mean, like everyone here might be very talented cooks, but I have friends that like will tell me, I don't know how to cook seafood. I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I spent $24 on a you know pound of salmon and I dried it out and it was awful. You know, those, so people get kind of, kind of worried on that and, and you eliminate a little bit of that in, in canned fish. Cause you really just need to heat it through if you want it to be consistent with the dish that you're making. Yeah, yeah, you don't really have to cook it anymore. Just get it a little warm. Yep. Uh, good wine pairings for tinned fish. Oh, God, that's a. I'm not the biggest. Well, I mean, I enjoy wine. I'm just not savvy to mm -hmm. to really talk to it. But I can tell you what I like, and I like um, Chenin Blanc a lot. Like that minerally white. Yeah. Uh, with with the mackerel and the mussels, uh, Sau Sauvignon Blanc also on the white side, and then I'm like a big Cabernet Franc person. Oh, I was going to say so, Cabernet Franc. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that goes really well with tin fish. Especially like the savory sofrito mussels are great with with that with a Cab Franc. But that, I mean, like I'll drink that with just about any food. It's just a very delightful wine. Yeah. Yep, I tend to go with the whites with the fish, but uh, you can definitely do some of the reds as well. Yeah, and that's the fun thing with any of these. Like you can, I don't know, with wine, with food pairing, with wine pairings, with beer pairings, you can go really similar and do a really light, like the, the smoked mussels aren't super overpowering in flavor. So you can go with a light wine or you can go with something really bold and just play around and see what you like. Because uh, they both will make the food taste a little bit different depending on which angle you go with. 
especially the smoked options too. You don't have to be as gentle because mm -hmm. that smoke's there. Yeah. Fantastic. Other questions, everybody? Oh, any plans for tinned razor clams? Great question. I don't know if razors, they're delicious, but I don't know if they're, we've had samples in the office and I've bought them on my own separately, but I don't know if razors are on the agenda, but there might be a clam variety in our future that uh, that we would be preparing that are, I had samples maybe two months ago and they're awesome. That's great. Clams are one of my, that's definitely my favorite shellfish. Yeah, big fan also. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Danny, such a pleasure to have you here and hear all the stories about the processing and the fish uh, in Patagonia. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody, for coming and joining the tasting. I hope you enjoyed the dinner. Uh, and I think we are going to wrap it up. I hope to see you at another future event. Uh, I think I have a little, here's a little ZXI form if you guys want to give us any feedback on this. Uh, and I have a last question from Howard. Any difference between the fish in the tins and in the pouches? So it's essentially the same process. <clears throat> it's just a different uh, format. So the pouch is called a retort format and it allows us to maintain that fillet portion <clears throat> for the presentation of the fish uh, and for portioning out. Um, but really at the end of the day, canning and retorting is a very similar way to preserve fish. Yeah. It sounds like you guys are working hard on the packaging and trying to make the packaging as friendly as possible, but it's a huge uphill battle. Uh, but it sounds like you got a lot of things in the works. So yeah. The tins are probably a little better for packaging than the pouches. Yeah, so the aluminum that we use in the tins is very recyclable and we use FSC certified cardboard for the carton of the, the, fit, the <clears throat> canned line, um, all recyclable. You just gotta make sure you clean it out before you throw it in the recycling bin. And then the retort is not, that is a pain point for ours. It, it uses a, a minimal amount of material, but like it's still material that goes to landfill. The box is as like forest, forestry stewardship council certified and very recyclable, but that is one of our biggest priorities is, is packaging, what to do. There's a lot of greenwashing and packaging too. Things sound good, but aren't actually good. You gotta really parse all that out what's actually being recycled, how is it being recycled, how do we educate consumers better on proper recycling techniques? Yeah. I mean, it is very complicated and we would love to find solutions, but I think everyone's stomachs are, or is it eyes are bigger than their stomachs is kind of the food thing with packaging. There's a lot of great ideas, but very little actual solutions right now that we're, everyone's working towards. So yeah, we would yeah. love to find, be a part of that. Yeah, it's a it's a hard nut to crack because you can have something that's recyclable, but if your local recycling doesn't take it, it doesn't necessarily do you any good. So we got to figure out a national solution on this one. Absolutely, yeah. And I just want to say thank you, Grace and the Zingerman's family, for for having me for this and putting this together. It was great. And thanks to everybody for taking the time to listen. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure having your products. Have a good night, everybody. We'll send you the recording tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.